My name is Joe Geiger. I'm the Director of Archives and History, and I'd like to welcome you and thank you for coming out this evening. We have a, a very special speaker with us this evening, as you know, Stan Bumgarner, and uh, I'll introduce him in just a second. I have a couple of orders of business to take care of. Uh, this is uh, a busy month for us. Uh, I'll, I'll give you some information about that in just a moment, but I do want to talk about just a couple of upcoming lectures that we have in the Archives and History Library. Uh, on October 11th, Greg Carroll, our own Greg Carroll, will be talking about Civil War medals. And so that's a very interesting, and maybe the last chance we'll, uh, last opportunity we'll, we'll have to listen to Greg as he's going to be retiring at the end of this month. Uh, so that's next Thursday. Uh, we also have on October the 18th, the following Thursday, we have Annette Erickson who will be speaking about uh, Thornhill Estate, which is near Volcano, the endless cable system. Uh, that ought to be very interesting. The other lecture that is uh, being delivered as a part of Archaeology Month uh, will be done by the McBrides. They will be talking about frontier forts, and that will be on October the 25th. So we look forward to that as well. Uh, on November the 8th, we will have Pat McClure, a volunteer here, who uh, recently wrote an article about the 1942 WVU NIT championship basketball team, uh, a tale for Veterans Day. So uh, we'll look forward to that. It's a very fascinating story. On November 13th, we have our own Dr. Ken Bailey will be speaking uh, on the topic Scratchem and Suem. It's a lecture that he's done as part of the Humanities Council this, this year as well. That again on November the 13th. And on December the 4th, we will have our annual showcase. And I'd like you to go ahead and Mark your calendars and, and make sure that you make plans to be with us that evening as we pull down documents and different things to share with you on that, on that special evening. Um, I have a document that I want to share with you that we received yesterday. This is a proclamation by Governor Earl Ray Tom, and it reads, Whereas archival institutions in West Virginia are essential to collecting, preserving, and making accessible historical records that document the rich and unique history of West Virginia and its people, and whereas historical records provide the people with a window into the creation of West Virginia, its economic and social development, and the lives of past generations of its citizens, as well as the development and implementation of public policy and the evolution of human rights, property rights, legislation, and constitutional law. And whereas West Virginia archivists enable the people and state leaders to understand issues and make informed decisions. And whereas dedicated archivists in West Virginia make unique historical records available in research libraries and use new technologies to share documents and information with people around the world. And whereas interest in learning about and reporting family histories and genealogy continues to grow in popularity. And whereas the Society of American Archivists and the Council of State Archivists have designated October as American Archives Month and a 2003 presidential decree designated October as Family History Month. Now therefore be it resolved that I, Earl Ray Tomlin, Governor of the great state of West Virginia, do hereby proclaim October 2012 as National Archives Month and Family History Month in the Mountain State and encourage all citizens to join me in this observance. And this is signed by the Governor Earl Ray Tom. So we're very thankful for that recognition from the Governor. Now our speaker, as I said, it's kind of a homecoming because we have uh, Stan Buckard this evening. Stan, of course, worked here. Stan uh, has been a professional historian for more than 20 years. Uh, he's worked at Harper's Ferry National Historical Park. Uh, he worked for the West Virginia History Film Project. He worked here at Archives and History. In fact, if you use the Archives and History website, uh, you should know that this is the man who actually started the website. Uh, Stan also has uh, worked as the acting director of the West Virginia Division of Culture and History's museum section. And between 2005 and 2009, he served as creative director for the State Museum Renovation. So if you go through that museum downstairs, you can know that a lot of that work was done by Stan Bumgarner. He also, uh, in 2009, developed the South Charleston Museum Foundation's new Belgian Glass Workers exhibit, 
and currently is collaborating with the museum on a project to document the memories and photographs of retired Kanawha Valley chemical industry workers. He also created a traveling exhibit for the documentary The Great Textbook War and later helped write an accompanying curriculum for the documentary and exhibit. He's also a pretty good fiddle player and pretty good singer. I don't know if he's going to entertain us uh, uh, this evening, but we're very thankful to have a, a very special speaker, Stan Butler. Thank you, Joe. I think I still have, uh, I think Joe has my old extension number. That's changed recently. That's how I remember how to get in touch with him. Things don't change too much. Um, thanks for having me here. Thanks for coming. I'll try not to go on too long because I tend to do that. Uh, this is this presentation is based on a book I did uh, in 2006 uh, called Charleston. I tried to come up with a catchy subtitle and, and I just ran out of time, so I thought, yeah, that kind of summed it up. So it's um, although a friend of mine read it, and uh, this is kind of the sad part of this is anybody familiar with you know, Charleston buildings and historic preservation of Charleston, she said the subtitle probably should have been, and now it's a parking lot. <laughs> and it's, it's kind of sad how many of the captions actually do end with some variation of that. And I do have copies of this. If anybody would like a copy afterwards, they're $20. And I'm going to do the ad more than once or twice at the end. And um, I'd be glad to sign it for you. And also, to plug uh, different colleagues' books up here, Billy Joe Payton has a, a more recent book out in Charleston, Then and Now, which is a kind of a different perspective. It's really interesting where he takes uh, old photos and he puts it with the current views. So if you don't have a copy of Billy Joe's book, I'm not selling them for him. So if you have any more deal with him, we can sell each other's books. But I encourage you to try to find that uh, either online or one of the local stores. And then there's still the, uh, the, the, the kind of the, the seminal books that have been done back in all county, which were Richard Andre and Stan Cohen, uh, the two volumes they did. And if you had that first volume, you could probably make a good, a good lot of money from that right now. Because it's, it's been out of print for a long time, and I don't think they have any intention of printing it again. So I, I, I've heard some outrage, not outrageous, because it's probably worth it given how rare it is now. But hundreds of dollars that book is selling for. So if you have that copy, hang on to it. And volume two, I think, is still available. on The hobby shop on the west side has a good selection, too, of, of Charleston and West Virginia books. So there's my commercial for local authors. Um, I'll just kind of walk through here. I started with this kind of generic photo. This is, um, if anybody's, I don't to talk too much about postcards in general, but. It, there is an era and there's a feel about postcards. Um, there, there's kind of the glory days of postcards went in about two or three different eras. Um, they, it, it really kind of starts in the late 1800s, but they're, they're not picture postcards at that point. Um, they become, you, you know, they're blank postcards as a way, as a, ma a way of mailing things. And then you get, as Elaine and I were talking about earlier, you get some of the, the artistic ones that are done. Some of the old Easter and, um, and Christmas cards, very Victorian looking. Um, very, they're works of art, really. And then it's about 1905 is when the whole thing just starts taking off, and you start seeing just a, a, an abundance of, uh, of uh, photos of postcards. And so from about 1905 up to about 1915, and then you have another era from 1915 to 1930, and then the, during the Depression, they, they start getting cheaper in quality. They're not as good. Um, sometimes it's hard to even tell what they're, they're up. Um, and then eventually it just kind of fades away. And then it really, it's the 50s and 60s which kind of ushers in the modern era where we're looking more at, it's not the ordinary buildings, but it's the, the beautiful scenery. It is the, the more striking buildings. Um, it, it becomes more of a marketing thing. It becomes more of a sales thing. And all of it's very interesting. But as you look at postcards, they are from those different eras. And after a while, they're kind of like baseball cards. You kind of look at them and tell, you know, this is from the 50s or this is from the 60s. So this is kind of a classic view of uh, everybody in the world had one of these. Um, any, any Bruce Springsteen fans, it's his first album has one of these from Asbury, because Green's from Asbury Park. And, um, and this one actually has elements from Charleston in it. And this is, I just put this one in because I'm always, uh, always entertained by these. Greetings from Charleston, West Virginia. I'm still trying to figure out where these are. <laughs> <laughs> Obviously during a flood. Um, it was exciting at that point. Maybe, maybe it was Myrtle Beach since it's kind of an extension of Charleston. So maybe, maybe they made that an honorary part of Charleston. So what I'm going to talk about a little bit is just the... Um, just how Charleston developed. It, it doesn't get too much in the social part of Charleston, but I think what what has always kind of fascinated me, and it lends itself well to postcards, is, 
is the uh, why things are where they are. Why is the city where it is, where towns exist where they are, within that town, why are the buildings where they are, why are they grouped where they are, why are some buildings, why is there an old section and a new section, and sometimes there, there are no answers, and sometimes it's the stories we just make it up and it sounds good. Um, and this talk will be a little combination of both, probably. So it's, I think it's more of a geographic history to understand why things develop. And um, first of all, just starting out, um, obviously it's like what, what I'm going to talk mostly about is the last 200 years of the European white settlement in this area. But I'd be remiss at pointing out that, that there has been settlement, there have been people living and hunting and, and moving through this area for over 12,000 years. And that, uh, that, uh, that with the, again, the, the time periods move around, but you know, now they're estimating maybe 12,500 years ago or when the first prehistoric uh, cultures came through here. Um, the Adena Mound in South Charleston is, is one of the few artifacts, we, visible artifacts we have left. Obviously there are arrowheads and things in the ground, but in terms of visually, there's very little record and we know very little about them. Um, even from the, the burial mound, as much as it's been studied and, uh, and researched over the years, um, it's about 2,000 years old, and I, I think this image is very interesting, obviously for a couple of reasons. One, this is in the early days of South Charleston as we know it. This is probably about 1910, and you can see the roads are, are just starting to develop there. And what's interesting is in the back right corner there, that's a photo of Banner Glass, which um, I'll talk a little bit about the South I'll try to get too much into South Charleston, I'm interested in that topic, but I'll talk a little bit about that later. But it was this cooperative of Belgian glass workers who come to South Charleston. They're really among the founders of modern South Charleston. So it's interesting to me that we have both of those in the same image. Now, the prehistoric cultures, for whatever you may have heard, you may have heard about prehistoric cultures and Native Americans, American Indians, they're, they're not in this area, living in this area at the time of the first white settlement. And there are some exceptions throughout West Virginia, but in this area, in the Canal Valley, they are not living in the same place. But there are conflicts early on, and where that develops, is they're still using this as a hunting ground. Most have moved uh, west and north of the Ohio River. They still come into this area. So there are conflicts with white settlers who are moving west and, and moving closer and closer into these areas. And that's actually, and I, this is one of the things I don't have a postcard, I saw this, I'll just point it really quickly, is, one of the reasons towns in West Virginia exist where they exist, the oldest towns, is most often they're associated with a fort. And that these forts were put uh, up for protection, uh, protect the settlers uh, from American Indians. And again, unlike in the Westerns where everybody you know, lived in the fort, you know, these forts had very few people actually living in them. And they had some militia assigned to them. Then if there was a sign of trouble, people would rush to the fort for protection. So the forts actually, were, were a little bit of a kind of a police force. It was kind of a civil uh, entity here that gave people protection. And and with Charleston, the first white settlement really doesn't begin until 1788, when um, when George Clendenin brings his family and a group of settlers up here, and they build Fort Lee, which is now it would be a, on what's now the Boulevard corner of Brook Street up from Brook Street a little bit, and that formed the basis for the settlement of Charleston. Now, due to other national events, the threat of American Indian attacks only lasted for about six years. And there are some documented uh, events here in Charleston, uh, but they're relatively few compared to what you, you would hear about in other parts of even West Virginia. Um, so the fort served its purpose in attracting settlers to this area, but not long after it was built, within six years, it really didn't serve much of a purpose as a fort anymore. But it was an anchor for this town of Charleston, which was established in 1794, again, by Clendenin. And Clendenin's kind of an interesting character because he's a, he's a, um, he's a, he's a land developer, he's a, he's a farmer, he's a politician, and um, one thing to remember is in 1788, this is still part of Greenberg County. And Clendenin is a, is, a, is a delegate to the Virginia General Assembly from Greenberg County. And so he manages to get authorization to have the fort built here, and he gets um, approval, authorization to extend the old state road, which goes all the way to Richmond and beyond, to Charleston. Now, that doesn't happen in his lifetime, 
but again, by his influence, he had this fort built on his property and this, what would be today, a major highway going through his land. So in some ways, maybe politics hasn't, hasn't changed too much. There's still, you know, it's, it's, they had the influence to do this. You got the town created. And at the time, it's a town of maybe 100 people. You know, I think they estimated there was only 20 dwellings in the entire place, but it's established as a town. And um, what, and, and that's an important point because Charleston isn't, you know, you know, it isn't a town. It is legally, but it's not really a town in essence. But there's several things that changed before the Civil War, and then after the Civil War is when we see the modern Charleston develop. And just to point out, you know, there, there are several things that have always been the, the drawing, the drawing uh, elements of Charleston. These things have also been deterrents at times. You know, natural you know, geography of West Virginia is, um, you know, we have all these natural resources, we have all these rivers, but different times of the year, you know, you can't travel. Even today, you know, there's certain places in West Virginia you can't travel in the middle of January. The rivers were like that very early on. The uh, prehistoric cultures used them quite often, but, you know, they were, before dams and locks uh, were built, they were very susceptible to the weather, and, you know, you'd have low water, you'd have high water, you'd have ice in the water, so whatever it might be, you could only depend on maybe being able to, to use the rivers maybe six months of a year. So it was hard to develop a, you know, a reliable industry based on this until they addressed the improvements on the river. Now one of the major developments I mentioned, the old state road um, coming through, it actually reaches Charleston in the 1820s. And uh, for anybody familiar with uh, Cedar Grove, and the history of Cedar Grove, Cedar Grove was the big town in this area, in the Canal Valley, until this road was extended. Because Cedar Grove, the, the old state road from coming over from Richmond, connects to Cedar Grove by the 1790s. There's a fort there, there's fans, there's, there's, there's a civilization there. Um, this road doesn't get extended until Charleston until the 1820s. But just like today, where we have three major interstates coming through Charleston, you had the equivalent of that back in the 1820s and 1830s. Because by the 1830s, not only do you have this road, which is the James River Canal Turnpike, and at the time this postcard was shot, this was Canal Street, which is now the Canal Boulevard on the east end. And, but it's the James River and Canal Turnpike at this point, Midland Trail, up through Hawks Nest, all the, the travel that we've all made many times. But then you also had two connecting roads, is that if you went to the west side over where Little Page Manor is, where um, Orchard Manor is, you could head north on Sissonville Drive and go to Ripley and go to Parkersburg, or you could head on what's now Route uh, 25 and go all the way to Point Pleasant. And so these roads were, were um, improved. Um, I should, they weren't technically built because there were paths there, there were roads there, but they were improved to make them significant roads by the 1830s. So Charleston became kind of a transportation crossroads. The other thing that the, the James River Canal Turnpike did, one of the places it went to, was Malden. And I mentioned Cedar Grove. Cedar Grove was one of the, the bigger towns in the area. Malden was the industrial center. And I'm sure most of you all know, it's like that was the center of the salt industry in this area. I will go to the big history of that because that could take up all time itself. But that was where the money was. Um, that was what it was attracting labor. And Charleston benefited as a result of it. And it's kind of ironic how it, it benefited, is that it benefited because Malden, like many industrial towns later on, was kind of a rough place. A lot of uh, laborers coming in. It was a drunken crowd a lot of times. There were a lot of fights. There were some murders. Um, and plus, it just the whole process of, of, uh, of uh, producing salt was not the most pleasant thing. It was very pungent. Uh, the smell that came off of it, the, the, the smoke was, uh, they said you could like stand in you know, what's now downtown Charleston and look 10 miles to the east and see black plumes rising up in the air. So what you what developed uh, in the in the 1830s and the 1840s is something later you see in the coal industry is that a lot of the salt operators who were making money off this didn't want to live there. They didn't want their families living in Malden. So now they have this nice road that connects them to this place where it's kind of peaceful, it's right on the river, and they build some of the nicest uh, home, homes and mansions in Charleston. A few of these still stand. Um, the Hubbard House, or the McFarland um, House in the, where the Humanities Council is, um, there's another, there's a Ruffner house, Augustus Ruffner built a place, it's kind of kidding, you have to look at it, 1506 on the boulevard, and it's called uh, 
I think it's called Cedar Grove, or Cedar Lawn. And it's a really nice little great brick building, and it's, it's kind of hidden by trees. And then one of the most obvious is right over here is Holly Grove, which was built uh, about 1815. Some of these also function as taverns. Um, there are many more houses along that, that route um, that no longer stand. Um, and this is where we get a lot of the, um, the names that we associate with Charleston today. You know, Goshorn and Noyes and Donnelly. Some of the, many of the street names are named after these early salt, salt operators who come in. Um, today, unfortunately, I think we only have about five of uh, those buildings that were built before the Civil War that are still standing. You have Glenwood on the west side, and um, which was built by the Laidleys originally, it became, became part of the Summers family, Porter family. Um, then you have the late the Little Page Mansion, and you have Holly Grove, and you have the Hubbard McFarland House, and you have the Augustus Ruffner House. And I believe those are the only ones that have been here the whole time. Now there, there's the cabin up at Daniel Boone Park. Oh, I forgot. I'm sorry, Craig Pat. So six. So the um, the, 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 there's ones that have been moved and kind of reconstructed and such, but those are the ones that have been here throughout. Slides are speeding up here. It's not a lot. I have very few slides from the 1830s. <laughs> I was lucky with this one because I, and I, you know, I talked about this. Um, one thing about doing a postcard, a book, a history based on postcards, is that it, it, it's it's kind of a challenge. It, it ties your hands. It's kind of like a game. It's like, there, I wanted to like tell the history of Charleston, but I didn't want to go outside of the postcards. You know, so many times I could have brought in a photo, I thought, okay, this would be great. Could I take a photo of, you know, Holly Grove or whatever and put it in there. But I wanted to play by the rules and, and keep it all postcards. And so I was lucky on this one, that this was an Ed, Edward Byer uh, painting. Um, Edward Byer um, is an artist who traveled uh, throughout Virginia and Western Virginia in the 1850s. And he's most known for his, um, for his, uh, for his illustrations of the springs, White Sulphur Springs, uh, Red Sulphur Springs, all the springs down in Monroe and Greenbrook County. But he actually got over here as well, and he gave us, I know this is kind of hard to see here, but he gave us really the only view we have of Charleston before the Civil War. And in his, I think most historians feel his, his illustrations are pretty accurate. He gets in a lot of details. Um, this, is, this would be from kind of the foot of South Mills, um, looking over toward uh, what's now downtown Charleston. And I don't have the, the talk loud, I guess. But just to give this some perspective, this right here would be about where the levee is today, that there were two ferries that operated on the, at the levee. This would be about Capitol Street, and this would be another one, a competing ferry. And I mentioned the James River and Canal Turnpike. It came right down here, and then it came down to what's now Clendenin Street, it crossed by another ferry, it comes over this side of the river and continues on. And there were ways from Clendenin Street, though, to get that way, to get north, to get over to those roads that I talked about that went to Point Pleasant and went to Ripley and Parkersburg. So, again, downtown Charleston becomes this hub of transportation. Um, as you notice, I mean, the one big thing that's kind of different from today is that all of the development is near the river. And that's for a couple of reasons. One is that by this point they have made some improvements on the river, particularly down at Red, Red House Shoals, where they can get uh, they get bigger boats up the river. Um, there's no railroad yet. Roads are you know they're they're still questionable. You don't move uh, industry and goods and a lot of people on them if you don't have to. So if you're having industry, if you're having any type of economic activity, it is tied to the river. And so the main businesses, the most prominent businesses in Charleston start developing, and they develop right along that Front Street, which is called Front Street. And, it's, and you'll see it refer to different things, the James River Canal Turnpike, later Canal Street, but all the activity is there. From the original design of, this, of the town is around those first two streets, Canal Street and what they originally called Back Street, or, or now Virginia Street. Um, the other reason that you don't have a lot of development in the back part is that, unlike today, you had a lot of creeks running through downtown Charleston. Um, there were a number of different branches and creeks that ran um, really from the, the hillside, emptying into the Elk and into the Canal. And, um, and it was very swampy. So you had some farming going on back there where they could take advantage of this, but it wasn't the best place to necessarily build houses. Uh, that's, that's addressed later with landfills. 
Um, the other thing that's interesting in this to me is that you know, the Ruffner family, which is a, a, a name that just comes up over and over in Charleston history, Ruff, the Ruffner family um, ends up buying, I mentioned George Clendenin, uh, Joseph Ruffner in 1795 buys George Clendenin's property, and then he adds property from the Dickinson family, and the Ruffners end up owning about everything at one point from downtown Charleston all the way up to Malden. And then they lease off this land and eventually sell pieces of it. But they at one point owned about everything. And one of the things that they had was the East End, what's now the East End, where we're at right now, that this was the Ruffner farm. That, and it was a working slave plantation that uh, you know, West Virginia, Western Virginia, compared to Virginia, didn't have nearly the number of slaves that, that uh, Virginia, traditional Virginia had, which was almost 50-50. Um, but in, in Charleston and Kanawha County, about 10% of the population was slaves. And most of them were working in the salt industry. But then you also see some who are working on these various plantations, including the west side was divided up into five plantations. And all the flats on the west side was just farmland. But the Ruffner plantation would have been everything on the right side there in the back. And again, that's where we are today. And in, in part, that explains some of the strange um, road patterns that, that you have up here, the one long block. It's just how that was divided up um, in the 1870s and, and that to the estate of the Ruffner family, not wanting to give up part of the estate at one point or time. And in fact, if you look on old maps, you will see this part of Charleston because until, I think, 1907, it's one of those dates I need to look up, until 1907 or so, this was not technically part of Charleston. Maybe 1895. 1895, this was not part of Charleston. Before that, if you look on old maps, this was called Ruffner. And I never understood where the term South Ruffner came from until I saw that one day. It's like, oh, okay, this was Ruffner and that was South Ruffner. So the South Ruffner stuck, Ruffner went away um, in terms of maps. So this is what Austin looked like on the eve of the Civil War. And that, as you can tell, it's a very small town. It's only the fourth largest town in what would become West Virginia. There's only about 2,000 people here, um, which is significant compared to some of the small towns. But, you know, West Virginia becomes a state during the Civil War, and the, the capital is in Wheeling. We'll talk about that in a minute. And in Wheeling, there are about 18,000 people. Wheeling is not on the level of Richmond, but it, I think it's about on the level of Alexandria and some of the larger cities in Virginia. So Wheeling's a major city, it's a major manufacturing city. Charleston's a sleepy little town compared to that. So when we look back on it now, sometimes some people ask, like, well, why didn't they put the capital in Charleston to start with? And it's like, well, it's basically a swamp with very few people here. And very you know, transportation was bad and there was little uh, economic activity. And I don't want to sell the economic activity because there, there was. So you, had, you had pharmacists and you had uh, lots of manufacturing that, that that the local area relied upon, especially the salt industry. But still, you didn't have the self-sufficient industry you'd have in a place like, like Wheeling or Pittsburgh, for instance. So, and this is, this is, um, this is the old Canal Valley Bank that was at the corner of Capitol and the Canal, now the Canal Boulevard. And it would be on the northwest corner. And I show this because this is a remnant of the salt industry, is that Charleston, Charleston had a bank very early on, but it didn't have a lot of capital, and it didn't have a lot of chance for a lot of capital until the Bank of Virginia decided to place a, um, to locate, um, locate one of its um, branches here in Charleston. And originally, it was supposed to be in Canal Salings, or Malden, and you even see some of the early, um, early bank notes, which is the Bank of Canal Salings. But the bank was actually established here at Charleston, and it was established right on that corner um, in the 1830s. And so after the Civil War, then the Dickinson family, largely as, a, as, as large investors, um, established Canal Valley Bank in 1867. This was its first location. And the other reason I can show this is that if you can count a parking building as being part of a bank, that, that means that this corner has had a bank on it since the 1830s because the Chase parking building is there now. Okay, so Charleston's a sleepy little town. There are three major events that change all this, and they're pretty simple, and I won't try to waste a lot of time on it, but I mentioned the transportation problems. Um, 
The first is the completion of the CNO Railway um, from all the way to Richmond and then connecting, obviously, to the, the Atlantic Ocean in 1873. And the last spike is driven in January of 1873 at Hawks Nest. Once that happens, is there is a way to get through central West Virginia for the first time. That the, um, that this part of the state, without going to the whole state of the debate, was largely ignored, really, Western Virginia in general was largely ignored for internal improvements, and that other than the James River Canal Turnpike, there was not a lot of connections. You know, for years, you know, there was, they tried to build a canal and it kept getting stalled and had money problems. The railroad had the same problems until Kyle Huntington took it over and was able to, to make it work. So when it arrives in 1873, suddenly you've got a new way to, to get um, goods into Charleston and out of Charleston, and you've got a better way to get people into Charleston too. Ten years later, in 1883, the Canal and Michigan Railway is completed into Charleston and from Toledo. And then ten years after that, in I think 1893, it connects with Golly Bridge. And the reason this is very important is that between the CNO and the KM, you have access into much of the southern West Virginia coal fields, which are just starting to be developed. And with the KM, Charleston becomes kind of a kind of a nice stopping point on the way north to places on the Great Lakes. Plus, down in the CNO, it connects with the Atlantic Ocean. So Charleston again is <coughs> an important hub in terms of the coal industry. Later, later in terms of timbering too, but coal is still the main thing that drives Charleston's development at this point. Um, I didn't mention this. This is another <coughs> important thing. It's not one of the things that take, helps Charleston take off. This is the old South Side Bridge. Um, and it was completed in 1891. Um, and it, you know, what you had, as I mentioned, I'm not sure I mentioned actually, the CNO was on the other side of the river. K&M was on this side of the river. And other than ferries, you had no way to get things back and forth. Um, and ferries are unreliable and depend on the river and you know the limit of what you can put on them. So the South Side Bridge was actually some investors from Pittsburgh and with some other investors, some of the primary investors were from Pittsburgh, put the money up for the South Side Bridge. It was built in 1891 and it connects downtown Charleston with, with the CNN. And this is really important. Um, in terms of, of what it means for the businesses in downtown Charleston. This is really kind of another turning point. The railroad's the main one, this is kind of a sub point. It also, incidentally, is a nice kind of taking off point for South Hills, that was, which was almost all farmland at that point. It's also interesting, you can see here, uh, the, the billboards. So like, advertising isn't a new thing too. That's another thing about history. So you think we're in this, this world where you know, we're kind of marketing and, and materialism. It's like, it's right there, it's all over that bridge everybody crossing the bridge. And the other important, the second really important thing was the improvement of the river. That there had been some improvement of the river before the Civil War, as I mentioned, but it got destroyed in the flood of 1861. Um, so there was a project after the war that eventually fell in the hands of the Army Corps of Engineers. And they started designing this in the 1870s. And they were going to design 12, um, 12 uh, locks and dams spanning the entire Canal River, going up to Falls at Golly Bridge all the way down to Point Pleasant. In the end, they only built 10. Um, and, and these were kind of unique types of dams at that point. They were the first types of other kind built in the United States. And um, it was built on kind of a French model. And it's still kind of, the technology functions the same way today, of lifting the boats up and down to get, to get past those certain points. And with this, you have three locks that are built in the Charleston area. You have you have the one up at Dickinson, you have the one at Marmette, and you have the one in South Charleston, locks four, five, and six. And with this, you created a they created a 14 mile slackwater navigation pond, basically, where these huge coal barges can come in and park. And before this, we had limited access to the coal industry through the rivers. But when this is built, when these dams are put into place. Charleston becomes a major center for the coal industry in West Virginia, particularly in, in this region, but also in southern West Virginia. You start seeing money pour in here. Some of the biggest coal industry, uh, coal op uh, operations in the state have offices here. Um, coincidentally, you also have lots of lawyers showing up. So there, there's lots of ancillary businesses that go along with all of this. 
And um, in, in Kanawha County, too, this is something we don't think about today, but like in the 1880s, Kanawha County was the second leading coal producer in West Virginia. And even by the teens, I think it was still the fifth leading coal producer. So this was a major industry. The other thing that's kind of interesting, and I, I doubt you all can see it. You may be able to see it a little bit. But that's the old CNO Depot. And there aren't a lot of photos of it. There aren't a lot of good photos of it at all. And it was kind of building the old CNO, what I call the old CNO Depot design, kind of a board and batten design. And, and it's what you've seen in movies and everything else. And it apparently was an embarrassment. It had been there since 18, the 1870s. And the CNO was embarrassed by it. Charleston was embarrassed by it. And so in 1905, the, um, the new CNO Depot is open, which is obviously really spectacular as, as depots go. I mean, you, you, the one, the CNO Depot in Huntington is, is very impressive. There aren't too many in West Virginia that, that can compare with this. And obviously, this is one of the ones we still have around, so we haven't turned that into a parking lot, fortunately. Um, then the third thing that comes along that's really important is the, the capital. Is that, I'll try to do the very quick history here, but the capital is built, when West Virginia becomes a state, Capitalism will be away in 1863. By 1869, Democrats are gaining more power. Wheeling's a Republican area. This is way oversimplified. Wheeling is a, more of a Republican area. Um, more of the Democrats are concentrated in this part of the state. And they kind of um, make deals with some of the Republicans from this part of the state. And they vote to move the capital from Wheeling to Charleston, with some money coming in from the city of Charleston to make this happen. Now what you see here is the second capital that was in Charleston. The first was on the same site, um, downtown, corner of Capitol and Lee Streets. Um, the first one, I don't have a postcard of, because there's only a couple of known photos of it ever. In fact, I'd never seen one ever until one show about 15 years ago. And that when they got here, you know, Charleston still wasn't that different. In 1870, this is still before the CNO Railway is completed all the way. It's before the locks and dams. So it's still kind of that sleepy little town. And, um, and, and we're talking about like, uh, how Governor Atkinson wrote at the time that, uh, before he was governor, wrote that uh, they would, the legislators would still find lots of uh, spirits and, and uh, wine and food and, and, uh, and taverns to go to here. And so they wouldn't miss wheeling that much. Well, apparently they did. It's like the, uh, there weren't that many taverns. Uh, the food wasn't that good. The town, uh, there weren't enough hotel rooms. Um, the capital wasn't ready when they got here. So they were spread around town. And so within five years, you know, they were kind of fed up with the situation and they moved the capital back to Wheeling. Uh, by this point, it's kind of a running joke, capital moving back and forth. So they put up for a referendum. And with Wheeling, part of the slap at Wheeling was that this was this Republic, Republican area, which the founding fathers of West Virginia, predominantly Republican, that that this is this Republic, Republican area. And so kind of a final slap in the face at, at Wheeling is the legislators only put Wheeling on the ballot. And Wheeling is still by far the largest city in the state. So it comes down to Charleston, Clarksburg, and Martinsburg, and Charleston wins easily. And so a lot of improvements are happening in this time period, in part to try to win back the capital, then second of all, to try to keep it once they get it here so people aren't upset anymore. Uh, so one of the things they do is they put about $375,000 into this new capital on the same site, this Victorian capital. And the, technically, the, and the, the state offices moved back here in 1885, and technically there's a dedication in 1885. So technically it opens in 1885, and we always call it the 1885 capital. It's really not completed until two years later. So they're still working on this for two years. And then, one thing that you start seeing in Charleston is that between 1860 and 1880, the population of Charleston triples. And then beginning in 1880, you have this massive growth that we're going to talk about a little more that is just coming rapidly. Again, spurred on by the railroads, the river, and, and the, the capital being located here. But then all the businesses that come with it and all the professional groups that come with it is that you have all the makings for a major, for a major modern city here at this point. So the capital opens in 1885, and in less than 20 years, they've run out of room in the capital. And so they, across the street, where the Huntington Banks building is now, the old National Bank of Commerce, they built the Capital Annex, and which is kind of a fortunate uh, thing in history because the Supreme Court and some other offices move in there, but also the State Archives and the State Museum move in there, which becomes fortunate when 16 years later the Capitol catches fire. 
So we're fortunate that we have many of the things that, uh, many of the artifacts that were in the early museum and the original you know, records, archival records, are still here because of the Capitol Annex. And for many of you, you may remember this as the old uh, public library, because um, after the Capitol was moved up here, this building was not needed anymore. And so it becomes a public library. It's also used by Morris Harvey College, um, at least for some of its classes when it moved here from Barbersville in the 30s before the, uh, what's now University of Charleston was built in the late 40s. So this building has a lot of fond memories for a lot of people and it uh, unfortunately it was kind of, when they, when they abandoned it uh, to, to go into the current library, they let it deteriorate and then it, uh, while it was waiting demolition, it caught fire, which unfortunately is another theme of Charleston buildings that we have. Uh, mysterious fire tall buildings are waiting to be demolished. But the, um, and that's, you know, as, as we, think about a new library being built, hopefully we can all be a little more proactive with the, uh, the current building, which is, and it's, I think it's 100 years old this year. So hopefully we can find a use for it before it starts falling in disrepair. Um, again, just showing that you know, city planning and government planning and, and just that, that whole geography thing I was talking about, where things are built. You know, you try to guess, they do it with schools today, you know, what's the population gonna be in 10 years, in 20 years, and you build your government buildings, you build your schools, all that, anticipating that you know how big the, the town's going to be. Well, the county courthouse, the current county courthouse was built in 1894, and here you see the original section of it. You can still kind of go down and look at it. If you notice, obviously, there's this big sidewalk here in front of it. That's now filled up with the front part of the courthouse. What most of us think about is the front of the courthouse was not even there in the beginning. And it was, it was added on in 1917. So 23 years later, they've already had to run their courthouse. Five years after that, they have to build an addition on the back. And the reason for all this, and, and it's not all pouring, people pouring into Charleston. It's partly where Charleston's expanding its boundaries and taking in more territory. But part of the reason it's taking in more territory is the population is spreading away from downtown. That Charleston's population between 1880 and 1920 grows from about 4,000 to almost 40,000. So, I mean, that's a 40-year span that's just kind of remarkable. So in that time period, it was kind of hard for the city planners and, and county planners and state planners to keep up with the type of growth they'd be facing. Okay, so now we're gonna just kind of go look a little tour through downtown Charleston. This is, um, this is one of the great photos of, um, I would love this one in a postcard, I'd love to see this in detail. This is one of the great photos of, of Charleston history. And this was about 1905. And, um, and it may be a few years before, but that's about it. And what, I like to start here because, as I mentioned, going back even to the Edward Byer um, um, illustration from 1854, the main business section of Charleston was right there on Front Street. That this was this was where the business section was. That this is if you were if you lived in Charleston from 1870 to 1900, or even before, if you went shopping, you probably would have been going to Front Street. And this is kind of the last heyday of because of several things. One is that they're starting to build up the, what's now we think of as the downtown area. The capital is drawing buildings closer to it and businesses closer to it. Um, plus, you've got the kind of Michigan Depot, so you don't have to be right here on the river anymore. It's still important, but the, the big businesses are starting to, to go back. The other thing that's kind of interesting about this image is that that most of the buildings you see on the right, in fact, all the buildings you see on the immediate right, um, were built about 1874. And the reason we know they were built about 1874 is there was a devastating fire in January of 74, which destroyed that entire block. So you have, that's one of those things, again, when you're looking at why things are where they are, it's interesting that all those buildings kind of had the same look and feel because they were built about the same time. And they changed appearance over the years, but they actually stood there until the 1960s. And this would be, for anybody, this would be, the again, the parking building and plaza of Chase National, the old Charleston National Bank here. And again, you're, you, you would be standing about Capitol Street and the Boulevard looking west there. Okay, this is, um, this is the first block of Capitol Street. And the way this starts happening is that it really starts, the downtown starts growing from about what's now the boulevard north, and going about one block at a time. So this is the first block. This is the, really the oldest block um, that, of Capitol Street. 
Um, this is some of these buildings date, date to the 1870s, um, the others date to the 1880s. Um, this would be staying at the corner of Virginia Street and um, at the corner of Virginia and Capitol Street. And on your left right here, right now is where Jimmy John's is located. Um, historically, it was the Potterfield Drugstore was there. Um, what's interesting is about everything on the left is still standing, but they changed the appearance over the years so many times that it's really hard to uh, it's really hard to picture it. There's one building that is kind of boarded up. And the next time you're walking in that first block, look about halfway down, you can see you can see plywood, and you can look up and see the stenciling for Daniel Grocery, and that dates to this time period. And the stenciling still there, and um, and you can a lot of times the building. I'm sure being history film, you know. The best thing to do is look up. Is that the, the, the storefronts, the facades have all changed, but they didn't just want to spend a lot of money on the top parts. So fortunately, you can kind of look up and get a sense of what the buildings look like. And you can still do that in this block a little bit. All the buildings on the right are gone. This was uh, they're wiped out again in the 1960s as part of urban renewal. It's part of that that mega um, that old Charleston National Bank parking building. This is uh, I, I love this photo because of, there's two types of. Photo, uh, of uh, postcards, and these let me cheat. Um, they're, they're not published postcards. These were how people took photos, and you know, you went to the local, you went to Spencer Moore, and you had it printed, and you know, the Kodak gave out free papers, postcard papers, so they print a lot of things on postcards. Plus, then you could write a little note. Um, this was a um, this was a, a clothing store, Jacob Friedman, um, at 17 Capitol Street, and. Um, and uh, this is a, in 1905, and this is his sales force. Friedman was a, a, a Jewish immigrant from Austria who came here in the late 1800s. And that's, a, that's another prominent change in Charleston. While all these people are coming in, a lot of people are coming in from other countries, and especially um, from Eastern Europe. You have a lot of uh, a Jewish immigrants coming in. Before really the 1880s, 1870s, you had very few Jewish residents in Charleston. The Frankenbergers were already here. Um, um, the, what was his name? The Secretary of State. I'm Drew Blank. He was here. And the, um, <laughs> the Dev, I like Dev was going to answer that. So this is going to be a quiz here. Let's see Daniel. if we can come up with that answer first. Daniel, so, somebody. I will say Meyer. Yeah. That's Thank you. <laughs> So, but you have very few uh, Jewish immigrants here. But once they start coming in, you see they come with family members, they come with extended family members, and, and you have whole communities that are developed as, as kind of Jewish communities. Um, the other interesting thing about this is that I, I can show you that, you know, the, the back sides of these cards are a lot of times just generic because, you know, they've just picked up a postcard of a, you know, of a school or a bridge or something and they just used it for writing letters. This one obviously was taken for a purpose, and whoever was writing it made some comment about the, this is a site for sore eyes, somebody living in Elkins. And so obviously they had been here and probably worked at the store, and they said, doesn't Jack look cute? And I said, this is Jack, the little boy over here. And then um, they referred to uh, one of the women as looking stunning, Pauline. So I, I have a feeling that the, the, the guy in Elkins had a little thing for Pauline. And, and because they, they say at the end of it, you need to come down here and see her. So this is going into the second block of Capitol Street. This is, uh, Richard Andres pointed this out the first time I really ever noticed it. If, and this is one of these things, again, where growing up here, I didn't really realize it because you're looking at the first floor. But when you start looking at the facades, and actually even with a lot of the restoration, you can tell that. This is probably the best preserved block in Charleston. Um, and this is, uh, this is the block where the library is, but this is on the other end. This is, uh, you're looking north from Virginia Street here. Um, but if you would go and stay in the same place, particularly the buildings on the right, would look very similar to what you see right here. And this is the same block looking from the other direction a little, a little bit later, because you, of course you see the library, which at that time was the federal building, built in 1912, doesn't become the library until the 60s. Um, but then you also see some of the, the, the mainstays of Charleston business that are no longer here. On the left, you have Kaufman Clothing, which uh, I think came in about the early 30s. And then you have S. Spencer Moore, right here in this building, which S. Spencer Moore actually goes back to the Civil War period um, and then moved into this location in the 1880s, where they stayed until, I think, 1987. 
So there were a couple of those businesses, unfortunately, we've lost in the last, some we've lost in the last five years, like Schwabi May, but some we've lost like in the last 25 years, like Ed Spencer Moore, that really had been here going back to the, you know, not the beginnings of Charleston, but really the beginnings of modern Charleston. So that's kind of unfortunate. Um, then this is the third block um, that um, it's, it's interesting for a couple of reasons. One, if you can see the old, for anybody who remembers the Scott Brothers Drugstore, is the Scott Brothers Drugstore was in the, the building in the corner of Raleigh Walkway, Old Five Street, Capitol Street, with a turret on the corner. And it was there from 1914, I believe, until it closed in the 50s. It was actually in two locations first. One was where the bar 101 is now. It's the old Cheers bar. I hate to keep referring to everything as bars, but that's other than parking lots. We had a lot of bars in that Charleston, so that's it. And then it moved into this building here um, in the 1890s and stayed there until 1914. And a lot of old photos you see of Scott's are actually from that building and not from the new one. Um, the interesting thing here on the right, you had identical buildings. Um, uh, one is still standing at 209 Capitol. Uh, the one you see immediately on your right, though, is uh, the old Woolworth built. Um, and they had, you, know, you had stands out front, you had open air market right there on the sidewalk. But of course, like what the Woolworth building is, is unfortunately known for is the devastating fire in the late 40s that killed seven firemen. Um, and the, the a new Woolworth building, at least title Woolworth building, was built on the site. But for anybody who wants to know what the old Woolworth building looked like, you can go look at 209 Capitol Street now, because they were identical buildings. And then during the same period, this is when we, we had some our buildings that we still are kind of treasure as the landmarks of Charleston. Um, the uh, Frankenbergers and the Canal National Bank were built there at the corner of, uh, of Virginia and, and Capitol in 1914. Um, it really wasn't, and you can still see, it's, it's kind of a two-sided building. Um, but the, the Canal National Bank went down in the Great Depression, so it's not remembered as well, even though its name's still on the building. Frankenbergers, of course, stayed until the 1980s, and most of us remember going to get closed there. Um, then on the one on the right is the Capitol Theater, which was originally built in 1912, and then it closed down in 1919. It was opened as a vaudeville, vaudeville theater. It closed in 1919, it was kind of remodeled for movies, burned, and then in the early 20s, it kind of reopened and stayed in operation until the late 1980s. And, um, and I'm sure many, most of you remember the Kears Theater, is that fortunately we were able to save this theater, even though the Kears uh, didn't quite make it. Some of those buildings have kind of burned as it was waiting for demolition. Um, growth in downtown Charleston was happening dramatically in the early 20th century. And so you had this, uh, this this new development, this wasn't unique to Charleston, you have this all over. But it's kind of interesting because we've, we've managed to preserve many of these. Arlington Court, it's these courtyards. And they're kind of the apartment buildings of the day. Um, they're nicer than most apartment buildings now, but they were the, they were the apartment buildings of the day. And you know, like I said, Arlington Court still exists. This was Hubbard Court. And this was actually on the site of where the Clay Center is now. And it really was, it was kind of a city planning thing and um, a business development thing to get more people in one space to make more money. <coughs> and, and so you have these popping up all over downtown Charleston. Most of them come about about the same time period. And then, with all these people, again, going from 4,000 to 40,000 people, they're all not gonna fit in downtown Charleston, even with the courtyards and such. So, with the modern, modern uh, utilities being developed, you're able to expand where the city is able to go. You're able to take water lines and roads and sewer lines into places that have never, never been there before. Um, this was kind of a private development, um, the whole Edgewood area developed about 1907. There was an amusement park on top of the hill, and like a little casino, and, um, and the golf course was uh, moved up there from actually on the west side. The original Edgewood golf course uh, started on the west side and then moved up to uh, where Cato Park is now. And if anybody knows when that golf course was built, I'd love to know. Because that's one of those things. It's, it's probably, it's got to be the oldest golf course in Charleston, and it's probably one of the older ones in West Virginia. So that's one of my trivia questions for the night. Um, then another thing that, uh, that really spurred development, and it did a couple of things. One is, you know, I, I mentioned the C&O and the K&M on the opposite sides of the railroad tracks. K 
K&M too, to some, with all the consolidations of railroads, people know different names. K&M becomes part of the New York Central, later becomes part of the B&O, and that's as far as I'm going to take the whole consolidation thing. Um, it, but they were never connected until this scheme was worked out, where another company would build this railroad bridge. And uh, it violated any number of antitrust laws because they were all in it together. Um, but it did ultimately connect the K&M or the New York Central with the CNO. But it also, in terms of the city planning, in terms of the city development, first of all, point out this, and I know this is a totally accurate depiction, but you can see kind of just how sparse the west side is there. The west side was, um, it's, it was kind of developed in two sections. It was developed what I call the near west side, which was really over to about Delaware. Um, it was developed as early as the 1870s. There was a lot of manufacturing, especially along the Elk, along the railroad line. There was some major, um, major manufacturing, major industries that, uh, that grew up over there. It was always considered kind of a rough place. It was known as Elk City. Um, but the far west side, where, where I used to live, is from Delaware on. And it, as you can see, by 1907, there were relatively few houses. But the development of the railroad bridge, which also had a streetcar line on it, and, and people could walk across it, helps spur the development of the west side. Now these, these are just fascinating to me, because there was, a, there was an amusement park that was about a block and a half from where I, I lived for many years, where my grandfather lived before me. And it was at the, it, it really took up most of the area between um, Park Avenue and Delaware, and then extended from the river all the way back to uh, Grand Street. So if you can picture the west side there. Um, it was, there were, you know, you know, Richard Andre has pointed out that some of the, the weird roads that you have on the west side in that area are follow the, the walkways of Luna Park. Um, also, the thing that was there is it, it was like like downtown Charleston. There were a lot of creeks. There were a lot of embankments. You see some photos of, uh, of Luna Park, and it was like a park with like rock outcroppings and, and creeks and little bridges going across them. Level Drive is an example of that. From that level Drive is that that was a that was a creek bed, and then. When um, it was in Luna Park opened in 1913, the roller coaster and much of the park burned in 1923. After that, it was sold off. Those those creeks were, were filled, and then houses were built on. So the west side is much flatter today, as is much of Charleston, than it would have been historically. And then another development that came about because of the of the railroad bridge was the city of South Charleston. And it's not a coincidence because the railroad bridge that I mentioned has a streetcar line. One of the main investors in the streetcar line was William McCorkle. I think he was president of the company at one point. And then he was also head of this um, Canal Land Company that owned all of South Charleston down to about where the break would be with Spring Hill today. That this land company owned this. And again, this swamp thing is going to come up. It was a swampy area. And so he knew that he had this streetcar line and he needed reason for people to go to South Charleston. He also had this land, so he needed to sell this land off. So he saw an opportunity. And there were, um, there were these uh, two companies out in Indiana that made uh, flat glass by hand. And uh, Dunkirk and Banner Glass. And he was able to convince both of them to relocate to South Charleston. He gave them a promise of three <coughs> Natural gas for two years, which anybody's familiar with the glass making, that's still a major thing. You need hot fires, you need something that can be made as hot as natural gas can make it. And so natural gas is a big thing, and they were running out of gas in Indiana. So he made him this deal, and he promised them this town that, I guess I guess there's no proof. It's a, it's a he said, and he said, and she said type of thing. But these, uh, these uh, people who came from Indiana were certainly surprised when they got here and they found no houses and it was kind of swampy. And for that first year, many of them living in boxcars during the, uh, during the uh, winter. And they, weren't, and, they, and they were kind of middle class, uh, middle class people. They'd come from a real town and they got here and it looked like they'd been dumped in the middle of the wilderness. So they literally, these, uh, and I always call them Belgians, there were, many of them were Belgian, some of them were German. Um, they really built the town of South Charleston, the modern town, from scratch. Now there are some things that were already there, but really what we think of South Charleston uh, grows from uh, 
this early day. This is Dunkirk glass. This was the second of these uh, glass factories that came in. This was located about at the entrance where Dow Chemical is now, the old Union Carbide entrance, almost right at the bottom of the Montrose uh, exit. So this was uh, Dunkirk. Now, I showed you in the early slide with the, the mound, Banner glass, and Banner was located about where Rite Aid is near, near the mound down there now. Then you had other areas like the east end developing, and again, it was just a matter of extending water lines and sewer lines and selling off lots, and it was done in a very organized manner. Um, this was, and you can tell the East End, and what's, again, I'm interested in how these towns grow. It's like, if you travel from here downtown, it's like you're going back in history. You can watch the houses get older. If you start downtown and come this way, you're, you're growing with the houses. That, and there are exceptions popped in here and there. But in general, if you start from downtown and come this way, you see houses built from the 1880s to the 1930s. Um, and this is one of the, this is, this is one of the older blocks. This is actually, this, this block um, was predominantly Jewish, and part of that reason is the Frankenberger uh, brothers were major real estate developers. And so, you know, in, in some, some cities you, you, you still had, uh, you had restrictive covenants and things where Jewish, uh, Jewish families couldn't live and they were kind of segregated in different parts of town. You don't see that as much in Charleston because of the influence of the Frankenberger brothers. And so some of these nicest houses in the East End here are owned by Jewish families. And you can even see the old Virginia Street Temple there oh, here on the left. And then I just think it's a neat photo, and partially because we're so close to it. This is Lee Street uh, looking uh, east uh, from, uh, from Beauregard. And, um, and you can see the houses getting, you're getting this artsy craft style house. It's getting newer. So you're getting into the 20th century. And, uh, but it's just kind of neat with the carriage there. And, and just the, the wide streets. I don't remember that street ever being that wide. <laughs> I think, I think there's, there's parking on both sides and it's two way. It always seems like I have to kind of pull over there someplace. Maybe we need to go back to carriages on that street. And then you kind of have the same thing with them. I was talking about the, how fast the growth is happening. It's like these are really, what I'm talking about here is like these are kind of suburbs before suburbs existed. You know, this is pre Levittown, but these are our suburbs because everybody lived downtown. But as the town started growing, as you've got a building, especially once cars start coming in, you can go a little further. Um, now we think of suburbs, we think of Taze Valley, you know, we think about all the, the, the developments that are way out of town. But this was kind of way out of town back then. I mean, if, you're, if you had a horse and carriage, or if you didn't have a horse and carriage and you're on foot, you know, it's a good walk downtown. So these were essentially suburbs. Um, the, I, I, I'd like to show this one because, the, uh, first of all, we're close to it here. You'll recognize the bottom of my annex is the Board of Education building. Um, the one on top was the original building, the Kamala School, a, a grade school that was built in 1907, again, because of how quickly the East End is growing. And just how quickly the town, the area was growing, and how kind of poorly they planned for it or anticipated it. The top building, Kamala School, was built in 1907 in what's now the Board of Education parking lot. They'd outgrown that in less than eight years, so eight years later, they build the annex across the street. And so this doesn't seem like just one time that this happened. The same exact thing happens on the west side with Tiscawall. Well, they built Tiscawall, and within, I think it's again, it's like eight years, they have to build an annex. And it's also kind of interesting because we're losing a lot of these old buildings like this now, you know, an old Bickley School, and um, it's fortunately the Historical Society did a great job in helping to preserve Glenwood. Um, a lot of these old schools are built in this time period. It's not a coincidence that so much of our, our, our architectural history dates to this really first 20 years of the 20th century. And I think we take a lot of it for granted because a lot of these schools did look alike. They were kind of, and um, being on that thing in the early 70s and the whole thing would shake when the truck would come across and you would sit, for whatever reason, they had the, in the early 70s, the lights were triggered where you could make, it seemed like you sat on that thing for about 10 minutes. I think the lights only lasted about 10 seconds on there. And the whole, the whole thing would shake, and it just, uh, it, it was just scary. But in 1915, it was, it, was, it was a masterpiece, I guess. And as you see, there's virtually nothing in Kanawha City. And um, now up on the eastern end, you had some industry up there. You had some factories. But there's basically nothing in Kanawha City. And the other reason, I mean, the bridge helps change that. But the other thing that, that, um, that is holding it back I know this from personal experience from my grandfather. My grandfather moved here in 1935. And he looked at property in Kanawha City, and he just said the, most of Kanawha City was a swamp. 
Again, we've got common themes here. We're close to the river, we're in the, the river plain. And it really wasn't until the, the, the next round of, of improvements occurred in the locks and the locks and dams on the river in the late 30s that that the, the swamp went away. And I remember my other grandfather talking about catching trout up Chapel Hollow. Is that there were that these little tiny streams that are here now were major creeks, especially after the rains. So a lot of the a lot of the look of Charleston changed um, naturally, and some of it changed very much intentionally to try to make it more livable. Um, the Canal City, the the big industry, obviously there for you know, most of the 20th century, were these two uh, factories. That both of which date to or relate to Michael Owens, who was a West Virginia native, born in Mason County. And um, on the right, the uh, Sheet Glass Company opened this Libby Owens uh, Sheet Glass in 1917, and it quickly became the largest sheet glass factory in the world. And they, um, under one roof, that's always the technicality they put on. The, uh, the, um, and it, it was spurred on by the development of machines that could make the that could make glass, make flat glass, a lot more economically, and it was a lot clearer, it was a lot purer than the old um, the hand-blown glass. So one, one effect this did have is it wiped out the businesses of the South Charleston flat glass people. Um, there were still some attempts to keep those going, but this, this company was cranking it out at such a volume, so much cheaper, and just pure glass, um, just, just clearer glass. And then across the street, was and then with Libby Owens, uh, Ford Motor Company bought in in 1929. That's where Libby Owens Ford name comes from. Across the street is the Owens Illinois Bottling Factory, and we had these all over the state, different places. And that uh, factory stayed open until 1964. Okay, this is you know I, mean, I mentioned that it was like I was kind of um, kind of hamstrung when trying to tell a history of, of a whole area through a few postcards, and the postcards were limited. These picture postcards are, are just godsends in this. This is um, this is a man who um, Edward Saunders, I believe, was his name. And and again, I'm guessing on that because I had to do a lot of research. I, I spent more time on this one photo than I spent probably the rest of the photos in the entire book because I I scanned it in really high resolution and I kept zooming in on the sign. And then I went back, came here, and I went through the old uh, Charleston directories and all, and I matched it up. And it's the West Virginia Shine Company. And it was on Dryden Avenue, or Dryden Street, Cameron's Avenue Street. But it was, and for any, some of you may remember Dryden, um, it's now, Dryden kind of ran directly to where the water company is. Came straight off of there. So it's underneath, it's where they used to have the farmer's market underneath the interstate. That would have been one of those streets over there. Um, Dryden was kind of a thriving street, housing, but there were also businesses. Uh, what's significant about it is that that, that was the historically the segregated uh, section of Charleston. And from really shortly after the Civil War is when it begins, and that is the, the segregated area. Um, that's where most of the African American people live. Um, you, but you also have, because you had that, that self contained African American community, you also had thriving businesses over there. It's like you had every type of business really that existed in downtown Charleston. You had grocery stores, you had the Ferguson Hotel, it was a magnificent hotel with, uh, with a huge ballroom. Duke Ellington would play there and would stay there. Um, you had pharmacies, you had uh, great places to eat, uh, just everything. You had, and just the West Virginia Shine Company is a shoe shine company, but he added laundry and tailoring services to this. So it was all very self contained. You also had some, uh, some, uh, some less respectable businesses over that it became known for. Um, but kind of associated with that, though, you also had that was the spot for music in, in Charleston, that especially even in the, in the 50s and 60s. You still had kind of some spots over there that weren't uh, maybe the most reputable, but you could hear some of the best jazz around. Because this was one of the most southern most places that a lot of black jazz musicians felt comfortable in going. So this would be the southern leg of some of these jazz musicians' tours coming through here. So Charleston got a lot of great jazz greats to come through here for this reason. And it's kind of ironic. Um, one thing I want to point out is Anthony Kenzer right here is like kind of taking it upon himself, and he he's had that whole area of there. Um, uh, declared as a local historic district, which is, is great, and it's it's kind of a unique thing because it didn't really it didn't apply for, it, it wasn't applicable for the National Register of Historic Places anymore because so much of it was just wiped out by urban renewal. That's kind of the other sad part of this is that you know 
the whole parking lot line. There are individual parking lots in downtown Charleston, but you go to what was called the block over there, and it's just block after block of, of parking lots in some places and parking buildings. And there's still a few really nice places. I encourage everybody to go over there. You can see like, the Maddie B. Lee home and um, and the um, and the the, the the Gilmore, Hardy Gilmore house, and just the, the Starks house, and the whole Garnet High School. And because this is another tradition of Charleston, that unfortunately we have less of that percentage wise than we have of everything else around. Um, but it's, it, it, and it fell to two things really. One is, it's kind of an irony, is that you know, integration in the 1950s actually kind of hurt some of these businesses is that once some of the businesses in downtown Charleston were enough, it's like some of the businesses, you know, they could go to some of the some of the shops on, on Capitol Street and pay less money than they were paying. Um, sometimes it was a little higher quality or getting clothes in from different places. And so a lot of the people who had, who were, a lot of African Americans who lived in that area started coming into the traditional white businesses and you quickly see these traditional African American businesses going out of business, really in about a 15 year period. And then what really wipes them out is this uh, concept of urban renewal, which I won't go too far in, but I mean, it was, I'm sure most, many of you lived through it, and you know, the concept of the theory was that inner cities were dying in the 50s and 60s, and that this was going throughout the country, and the theory was you tear down whatever's old, and you start over. Well, disproportionately everywhere, and you see it in Charleston, over in the, the Triangle District, in the block, you know, what, what became the area where the town center is now is that these were where four white people and African Americans lived. And, um, and, you know, although it's not documented, it's pretty obvious to see where that was concentrated. Now, they probably did some good things as much as I love old buildings. There were some fire traps on Capitol Street and on the boulevard by that point that were, you know, they were, the firemen had already said they wouldn't go in. If fire broke out, they would not enter the building. They would let it burn down rather than risk, risk the lives of the, of the firemen. So there were some positives that came out of this, but it was also used as this tool to kind of like wipe out this, this uh, whole area here. So we really, it's, it's, it's kind of a, it's kind of a, a, you know, kind of a black eye in, in Charleston's history. And you, can, and you can again go down Capitol Street and you see all these historic buildings from the 19th century, and then all of a sudden you enter this other area where it just looks like you know, almost like a bomb has gone off, but it just got wiped out. Um, and associated with that is that, you know, and I was, I, this is an interesting part for a couple of reasons. One is that it just, maybe this is the early days of driving, but either this guy's trying to take this other guy out or he just is trying to figure out how to drive. <laughs> Plus, maybe if you grew up with this, you would, it, this would have been easier to deal with. But I can't imagine the streetcars going right down the middle of Capitol Street while you drove on either side. Now the fact they didn't have parking on either side, maybe that made it a little easier. But again, that's that's kind of a narrow street. So I would think maybe he's swerving out of the way of the streetcar at that point. But the other thing interesting about this one is it shows some of the businesses. Um, uh, the Hotel Fleetwood is an old hotel again, you know, another parking lot that we have. But it's interesting too, we have the old O.J. Morrison store. <laughs> which many of you all re may remember down uh, close, to where, close to where Graziano's is now, which became its home like in 1920. But it actually started up in Jackson County, where O.J. Morrison was from, and then opened here, I think, about 1910. And it stayed here for about 10 years up the street. This is, by the way, this is that 300 block where Taylor Books, Allen's Ice Cream is. And then McCrory's here is exactly where Adelphia is now. And maybe you'll remember McCrory's. And you'll note it looks a lot different. There was a, this is the actual building, but there was a fire in the 1920s, wiped out the top floor, so they remodeled it entirely. The other reason I like to show this, and I'm showing at this point, is that, you know, is that when I talked about the integration in Charleston, is that you know it just didn't come naturally. Is that a, a lot of, um, of of black activists in the 50s took it upon themselves to conduct sit-ins along Capitol Street, and in one day they were able to integrate every lunch counter that was still open at that point in one day, with the exception of the diamond. The diamond held out for two years. But McCrory's was one of those. And that was in 1958. It was actually about 18 months before the, um, the sit-ins at Greensboro, North Carolina, which had more historical significance because of where they occurred, but it's still interesting that, that there was that type of activity here 18 months before that. 
And this is kind of the, I put this in there because it's kind of a, it's 1918. It's kind of the last, uh, to me, it's kind of the last uh, snapshot here before everything changes in downtown Charleston. And again, it's pretty easy to see because it hasn't changed much. Um, and then January 3rd, 1921 is one of those pivotal dates that is essentially out of people's control and changes the landscape, changes the history of Charleston, the geography of Charleston forever. About three in the afternoon, the Capitol catches fire. Um, it really is engulfed within about 30 minutes. It doesn't take long at all. It smolders for days. And, it, and the, the masonry walls are so hot that the firemen can't get close to it. One fireman's killed when a wall falls over on him. The fire department just pulls the men back at this point and just starts spraying water just to try to contain it. Um, it's, uh, it's fairly dramatic. In fact, there's very little from that capital that was destroyed so badly. There's a few artifacts were pulled out of it. Down the museum, there are actually a few things. There's some chimes um, that were in the bell tower, and you can see where they were charred. Uh, there were some things that were actually pulled out of the capital in, er in earlier time due to renovations. Um, but for things that actually survived the fire, it's a very short list. These are very small. If you can kind of see here, they'll pump or fire engine trying to find it, just how far away they are. Um, and the building totally engulfed in flames. And this is, you know, I've, I've had the opportunity to interview three people in the last couple of years who still remember this day. That's how dramatic and pivotal that was. Is that, in fact, the gentleman I interviewed a, a couple of months ago was born in 1914. And his memory was kind of spotty at different times. And I mentioned this day, he's like, oh yeah. And he was living on the west side. And he said he walked out the Lee Street on the west side and just, he could watch it from there. And I interviewed other people, two other people who just, they remembered it vividly. You know, you seated on their, their father's shoulders watching this. So obviously this was a dramatic day in Charleston history. And then it led to this. This is the, uh, obviously the new capital. About the time it was built, um, I think this is an, actually a Bollinger photo, isn't it, Deborah? That they, yes, I think it's a postcard made from a Bollinger. Yeah, and it's interesting here, if you look over at South Rutherford too, you know, University of Charleston, Morris Harvey's not there. There's a few houses over there, not much at that point. But when the Capitol burned, you know, it actually, it left, you know, when things change, you know, like that dramatically, it's not a good thing, but some good things came from it. There are a few remnants left, as I mentioned. One of the remnants, I'll like show this, is that this is the triangle. When everybody talks about the triangle, the Lee Street Triangle, this is it right here, is that if you look, Go this way. If you look, this was called State Street here. This is now Lee Street, um, and that block where like Sitar India is. Um, that was called State Street historically. Then Lee Street was that little that little mini street there, right beside the triangle, the where you turn in. Well, after the fire and after they started redeveloping the property, they just extended State Street straight right through and cut through the old Capitol lot and change the name of State Street to Lee Street. So you still have this little mini block here that used to be part of Lee Street. And then the old State Street came through and then created the triangle that way. Then we have three landmarks that come about, two landmarks that come about directly, one that comes about from another fire, is that right here, the smaller one you see is the Diamond Department Store, which opened in, in this location in 1926. On the corner of um, Washington and Capitol. It actually had been in business since 1906. It started as a shoe store and just kept expanding into other products. And then when it opened in 1926, it claimed to be the largest um, uh, department store in the state. And this is, this is exactly where the um, Capitol was. So the diamond is built on the site of the old Capitol, as was the Canal Valley Bank building, which opens in 1929. And for three years, it's the tallest building in West Virginia. And it keeps that distinction until the Capitol is built, which is a few feet taller. And then, while they're waiting on the Capitol here to be built, they built a temporary Capitol that came to be known as the Paceport Capitol, which should have been a giveaway right there if that was a problem. And it burned too in 1927, but fortunately, most of the records were out of there at that time. So when it's torn down, that's where the Daniel Boone is built. So three of, you know, from my childhood, and from most of the 20th century land, most distinctive landmarks of Charleston um, grow in the, the site of capital fires. 
And then I'll just end it here with a few shots to show how things changed and didn't change. Um, this is a, a photo from about 1915, um, looking, you know, I'm not sure where they took this from actually, but you would be perched somewhere in front of the library or a little closer to the river, looking north. This is 1950s, 1930. And looking north. And you see here the Charleston National Bank, which stood there until 1969. And then you see some of the other distinctive businesses can't read it from there. This is Schwabi and May in one of its, it, it dates to 1880, so it was in many locations before it moved over to the location most of us remember on Hale Street and, um, and Courier. And then um, the other interesting thing here also to point out is kind of like State Street, Courier Street didn't run all the way through. There's a little alley right here. And many of you may remember that too, because this is the late, late 50s is when this changed. It's when this was opened up all the way through. It was like a little alley and had little parking spots there. So that's 1930. This is the 1950s. And this is one of these things that if you don't look at the facade specifically, this hasn't changed much. This is, and this is, even by the 1970s, this is kind of what I remember um, as, as uh, downtown Charleston. You got A.W. Cox, you got Dan Cohen shoes. I mean, this is this kind of a classic shot for anybody who lived in Charleston from the 50s to the 70s. Then looking at the skyline, you know, this, this is some of the most dramatic here. This is from about 1904. This is one of these, I need Richard Andre here for this one, for us. It's like he could, he could tell me based on like the spire on the, the, the Ruffner Hotel, the <coughs> of the month. Because you know, there's two tricks. This is the old Canal Valley Bank, and I showed you that photo a long time ago, and it had kind of a spire on it. And then it gets remodeled, I think, in 1904, and then the Ruffner Hotel gets remodeled in 1905. You can almost pinpoint this photo, but I'm sure the dates are wrong. But the, uh, it's interesting because you've got all these buildings along the riverbank, which were here dating back to the 1820s or 30s. They built on both sides of the street. Um, these buildings stand until they tear them down to expand the boulevard in the late 30s. So here is probably about 1934. You still have some of these buildings still here. Um, not as many of them. You, of course, you have the Union Building. Um, not a very good shot of these, but these are these these buildings are still here. This is called the Cotton Block. Um, the Cotton Block uh, for it's on the Boulevard and that block between Capitol and Hale Street. For most of its history, the Cotton Block was filled with uh, saloons and restaurants, and that's what's still there. So historically, it's been that way for a long time. Um, then this one, th this is really amazing to me. This is urban. This is an urban renewal. This is early to mid '60s. I'm not exactly sure when all these buildings were torn down. But just kind of take that in for a minute. This is early to mid-60s. You have the classic view for, for uh, anybody who doesn't remember how cars used to park on the levee, and we didn't always have an amphitheater there. But that, you've got that spot. Um, these are the buildings I was talking about that were built in 1874, predominantly, after the big fire. And then this is only a few years later, about that 1970. How quickly it changed. It's a little different perspective because you didn't have the courthouse in it. But all these buildings are gone. This building is gone where the Charleston House Holiday Inn is and where the Charleston National Bank. All of that is gone within a few years and the entire look of Charleston changes. So really what you had in Charleston, you had these periods where, you know, in different parts of town, you had from 1870s to the 1960s very little change. And then you had this period of growth also in the 1880s to 1920s. And fortunately, we still have much of that, which is, is a credit to, again, historical societies. Um, it's credit to some of the, you know, the, the law firms and the groups in downtown Charleston that took an interest in it, the, uh, the, 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 all, all the different groups, the, the, the Charleston Renaissance, is trying to think of, that really decided that, okay, this is about in the 80s that this is when we could lose a lot of these buildings. And they dedicated to it, and we've been able to keep it. So. It's, you know, it's one of those things where the more they change, the more they stay the same, in that hopefully we're getting more back to kind of reusing some of these buildings and appreciating that all of these buildings tell a story, where they're, where they're located, how they look, why they look that way, that it's all part of the story of Charleston. And uh, next time you go downtown Charleston, just look up. No, don't, don't look at the facades anymore. Just, just look up the second floor, and you'll, you'll see a different look of Charleston. Um, that's it for I, I'll take questions.
And, uh, and again, if anybody would like a book, uh, they're $20. I'd be glad to sign one for it. Anthony. Back on a couple of years ago, during one of the trolley tours, you talked about a football field here on East End before Lady Field, where the, uh, around the area of the women's club now. Would you talk about that? Yeah, that was, uh, that was, East End's interesting to me for a lot of people. The, the, all the Victorian houses and kind of the outlandish houses that are in the East End, they're very interesting. But I, again, I'm looking at the growth of all this, is that if you look in this block most immediately to our, our west here, most of the houses were probably built in the 1920s, and some apartment buildings were built in the 30s even, and that's because the capital's moving up here. So before that, this was a big field. This was a whirly field. It was a football field and a baseball field, and, um, and it was used before they built Lately Field in the late teens. So, and it kind of like took up even some of the street space over here. And we had, a, there was another ball field on the west side where the new uh, grade school is on Florida Avenue. That was a big ball field. Questions? Well, thank you all. Okay. Yes. Do you have any knowledge of any long term plans or what they plan on doing with the union building? Union building is privately owned. So it's a, um, it's, I'm not sure there are plans. I think, I think it depends on if they can find um, potential tenants. I think that's what it comes down to. Um, the good thing is one of the really good things that's happened in the last 10 years is that the downtown historic district's been established, which will let a lot of these property owners um, get tax credits for uh, doing restoration and renovation work. So that's probably the best motivation. But that see, that's the thing, and that's why it's so hard to do much about this, is that almost all these buildings are privately owned. And it doesn't matter whether the building's on the National Register or not, you can pretty much do what you want with a privately owned building. Um, the only time that, that it really comes into any play of where, if you're, where there's any say from government is when public money is used or when it is a government building. And it, and it usually has to be 50 years old on top of that. Yes? Was there ever an airport in Kamala uh, City? There, there was an airstrip. And um, it was a, um, it was actually used by Billy Mitchell during the mine wars during Battle of Blair Mountain. It was used as a staging area. It didn't do too well. They got lost and they never played much of a factor. He was trying to show how air power could be used. But there was an airstrip that was there. Um, in fact, my father uh, talks about building this house in the, I think 1946 or something, up around Venable Avenue and 39th Street. And he had to, uh, he had to, use a, a pick to pick through the asphalt when they got down underneath the runway was still down there. Yes? They tore down the houses 